Hi, my name is Angie Ellis, and I'm excited to be with you today to share a little bit of my story with you. And I did grow up going to church, and I have pretty good memories of that. Um, we were pretty involved as a family. I uh, went to church most Sundays, and um, I remember going to a lot of potlucks and Wednesday night classes, um, was in the choir and did plays and things like that. So even though we were really involved in church and I remember having Bibles around the house and praying at meals and things like that. Um, when I look back, it really was more of a surface knowledge of what I was getting. Um, there was really no emphasis on having that personal relationship. Um, I didn't even really know what that looked, looked like. So as I grew up um, and hit middle school, I started going to Campus Life and through that organization I learned a lot more about how um, it was important to actually open your Bible and what that relationship looked like. Um, also that memorizing scripture could be helpful. Um, and so I think when I uh, think about when it started, uh, I guess my relationship with God and when my first experience was with that, um, I was middle school age. Um, one night I found myself, it was probably 7th or 8th grade, um, laying in bed and just praying, kind of pleading out to God. Um, I had a test the next day in English class and although I was usually pretty prepared and a pretty good student, for some reason this time I wasn't ready for it. And instead of staying up late to um, read the chapters, I found myself praying and I'd never really done that before. And I just remember laying there until I fell asleep. It seemed like I was praying for hours, just kind of pleading that we wouldn't have this test the next day. Um, so the next morning I went to school and um, as we were sitting in class, the teacher came up front and he announced that the test was going to be later that week. And while everybody was cheering and the excitement was going on, I, although I was really excited, I really kind of sat there in awe and kind of in shock because um, it was really the first time I felt like a prayer of mine had been answered. And at that point it wasn't even just that he answered my prayer, it was kind of where I felt like um, that was really the first time God was real to me. So when I look back at that time, um, it wasn't really the idea that my prayer was answered um, because as I as I can look back I can see God um, working through my life and I can see his fingerprints all through my life and there are many times that he did answer my prayers the way that I hoped he would um, but there were many no's and as I look back there were probably really good reasons for those no's but sometimes it takes a while um, to realize that and then there are times of waiting and there are still things I'm waiting for um, but what I've learned uh, when I look back at that experience um, is that it's really all about that relationship and God I've learned is he's always there and he's just waiting for us to take part in that it it takes more than one person to have a relationship what a great ending it takes more than one person to have a relationship and you know God's been He's been doing everything in your life to bring you to this moment. Um, he's, been, he's been wooing you. He's the hound dog of heaven that just keeps chasing us, trying to uh, win our heart. And he just wants us to take the next step of trusting him. And uh, really, that's what it's about. So God, we, we pray today that um, we thank you for Angie's testimony. We think of how you worked in her life and, uh, and you're working in her life still. And God, we, we thank you for how you uh, taught her to trust you. And God, I pray today that we could take that next step 
in faith with you. God, I pray for today for anybody who is not in a relationship with you yet, anybody who has not said, God, I just, I'm going to take the first step of trusting you. Even I heard one guy say it one way, um, God, I'm just going to trust you until you prove untrustworthy. And he said, it's been 50 years and I still haven't uh, found that time. God, we just want to trust you with our lives and uh, just pray that you'd be working here today. Uh, in the name of Jesus, I pray this, amen. I uh, had a couple experiences this week that were really powerful that I just got to sh share with you. Um, one of them was, um, in, I just was talking to this, this woman, about a 30-year-old woman, and uh, just a natural conversation, we found our place uh, kind of alone, and I said, hey, how can I pray for you today? And she just began to unload just so much hurt and addiction in her life. And as I began to pray for her, um, uh, didn't began to share the gospel with her, the amazing thing is about 15 minutes later, uh, she said yes to Jesus. And it was the most powerful thing. And, and I wish I could show you a before and after. 15 minutes and what 15 minutes different, made a difference in her complexion, in her demeanor, in just everything of God God working in that person's life. Just want to encourage you with that, that um, God is trying to write a story and win every single human being on this earth. And we can join with him and just partnering with him and, and uh, writing that story. The second one was, uh, I don't think I'll ever forget the spot on the road where I was listening to ESPN this week. Um, of all the things to be listening to and have it be a God moment, uh, I was driving down the road. Anybody listen to ESPN? I don't know. Anybody got a cup? Thank you, Caleb, for that hand. I appreciate that. <laughs> Raise my. Um, Chris Carter, who was a, a Hall of Fame wide receiver, was interviewing Stephen Smith, who is a a, a, a guy that's going to be a, in the Hall of Fame as a wide receiver. Um, he's in one of his last years of being a receiver. Uh, in the NFL. Just a tremendous, tremendously gifted receiver. And they were talking about, um, you know, he was saying, you're going to be in the Hall of Fame one day and kind of talking about his legacy. They were also talking about how a wide receiver, when they line up across the line from the defensive back or the cornerback, um, when they line up across, there's a lot of talking that goes on. And they, they jaw at one another and they say kinds of things like, I'm going to be here all day, you know, you better get ready, you know. And they just are constantly jawing at one another. And when they were, when Chris Carter was asking Stephen Smith, he said, or Steve Smith, he said, what do you want your legacy to be? And Steve Smith paused for a moment and he said, you know, I have a 10-year-old little boy. And one day... I want him to line up across from a defensive back in the NFL. I want him to look him in the eyes and say, my daddy beat your daddy, and I'm going to beat you. I am going to be here all day. I am going to be your worst nightmare. <laughs> he said, our family has beaten your family for centuries, and I am going to beat you today. And he begins to just go off like um, he, he's an African-American guy, and I wish I could do it like he did. He just, he just went off, and it was so incredible. I just about had to pull the car over because the Spirit of God just began to touch me and say, that's what I want for you. I, I want you, because our enemy is not a defensive back. Our enemy is the enemy of our soul. And I want you to get up in the morning and look across the line and say, I'm going to beat you today. I'm going to be your worst nightmare today. You're going to be afraid to guard me today. <laughs> and, and to say, and, and I want my kids to say, my daddy beat you and I'm going to beat you too. <laughs> and I, and I want to say, my grandma took you out. She passed along to my daddy, and my daddy took you out. My daddy passed along to me, and I took out. Our family has been taking you out for centuries, and we're going to take you out again. And I tell you, I just about had to pull over the car in, in that moment and saying, that is what is about. Are you, are you willing to say, I want to be the enemy's worst nightmare today? Or, if you don't want to be the enemy's worst nightmare it's like lining up for him and say, okay, 
take me out. <laughs> okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be worthless today. Um, I'm going to be of no use in the kingdom of God. Just go ahead and take me out because you're better than me. <laughs> and I don't want to do that. Do you? Do you really want to do that? Do you want to pass that legacy on? I guarantee you, Angie is saying, I want my kids to line up across from Satan and say, I'm going to be your worst nightmare today. <laughs> and kind of, are you in? Well, today, I want, I want to prepare you for some things that the enemy will do. He, he's only got a few strategies. And uh, at the beginning of this year, I want you to be free of his strategies. I, I don't want you to pass these things along to your kids and have them pass them along to your grandkids. There are some things in our life that um, if we don't deal with them, our kids are going to have to deal with them. And so uh, during, during this beginning of this year, those are the things that I want to focus on. Today is on anxiety. If you don't deal with anxiety, you're going to pass it along to your kids. Uh, you know, many of you could say, um, you know, my mother was a worrier, and now I'm a worrier. And do you know what? If you continue that, your kids are going to be worriers too. And it just goes on generation after generation after generation. Think about what took your parents out in life, whether it was temptation or addiction or um, unforgiveness or worry and anxiety or what was it. You are going to have to face that battle. And if you don't face it and win, the next generation is going to have to deal with it as well. So today what we want to do is talk about anxiety. We want to talk about worry. Um, what are the things that you are worried about? And do you have, a, have kind of a, a habit of worrying in your life? I was talking, now this was after the first service, after I preached all on worry. And I was talking to a person, said, hey, what you doing this afternoon? And they said, well, I um, think I got to get some laundry done and, you know, just so I can stop worrying about it. <laughs> You know, there's a lot of things to worry about in life, but laundry is not one of them. But isn't it amazing how if you start to worry about one thing, it doesn't stop there. And it'll get to the place where you're, you say, I am, I'm even worried about doing the laundry. When am I going to get it done? And, just, and we want to take worry and get it out of our life. And not only get it out of our life, but we want to get it out of our family's life. We don't want to say the words, I'm worried about something or I'm scared about something. Instead, we want to be people that tr are trusting God. So um, in Matthew chapter 6, there's one of the most beautiful passages on worry that begins at verse 25. Matthew chapter 26, uh, beginning at verse 25. Actually, this is right in the beginning because we see, what's the first word up on the screen? Therefore, which means there's something before this that relates to this passage. And you won't understand this passage unless you deal with what's before it and understand what's before it. We're, so we're going to go and study what's before it after we read this one. I want us to count together how many times we see the words worry in this passage. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry, number one, about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food, and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? There's the second one. Uh, by the way, how many of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to your life? Uh, not one of us. How many of you, by worrying, can lose an hour of your life? Not just the hour that you spend worrying, which is a loss of living that hour, but physically, it destroys our body to live in worry. It will cut years off of our life by worrying. So we not only lose the life of that moment, but we begin to lose our life, uh, period. Why do you worry, this is the third one, about the clothes, about clothes. See the lilies of the field, how they grow. They do not labor or spin, 
Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? So do not worry. I don't know, is that five? <laughs> but what shall we eat? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. That's number six. For tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Um, I guess about six times in that passage that talks about worry. So we can just close our Bibles and we can head off now because we're all done, right? <laughs> um, you know, if you, if you knew that worry is bad um, and you could stop by just making a choice to stop worrying, we'd have done it a lot long ago, wouldn't we? It just, so it's, it, fortunately... It's not just about saying, okay, I'm going to stop worrying. We've got to understand how we started to worry in the first place. And uh, so there's, there's one key component in here, and it, it, follow, it was the transition. He keeps saying, do not worry, do not worry. And he gives reasons why they shouldn't worry. But do you see the one statement in this passage that tells us how worry came in the first place and how we can stop it? It's verse 33. It's the one to memorize. It's the one to, to get in our hearts. It says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. There's, there's two things in this passage that we're going to discover that can stop worry, or if you don't do them, they will lead you to worry. The first one is the seeking part. You know, whatever gets our attention is, um, is going to get our heart. And when it gets our attention, the seeking part, if we begin to seek anything other than God, it will cause us to worry. So you just begin to ask yourself, what kinds of things am I worried about? And what you'll discover is those things have taken God's place in our life. It says this, there's a priority to this. Seek God first, and when you get God first in your life, then God begins to take care of so many other things in our lives. But if you get the order wrong and say, no, I have to have these things in addition to God, then um, worry is going to be a part. So what's important in our life, and kind of what things are we seeking? Do you remember a few um, months ago, I was talking about Isaac liking Happy Meals? And I'd say, you know, there'd be this conversation in the car, Daddy, are you happy today? <laughs> and uh, because he thought, like, okay, how do I get a happy meal? Why is it called a happy meal in the first place? And, oh, it must be when Daddy's happy, I get a happy meal. So, Daddy, are you happy today? Yeah, I'm happy today. Oh, good, then I get a happy meal. No, it doesn't, doesn't work that way. So then... Then he was like, Daddy, have I been good today? You know, have I, you know am, I, am I good? Yeah, I said, you've been good. Oh, good, because then I get a happy meal, you know. And, and, and then the one phrase when he said this, Daddy, if, if I'm happy, <laughs> um, or I'll be happy if you give me a happy meal. I'll be happy if you give me a happy meal. And remember what I said? I I, as a loving parent, there is no way possible that I could give him that happy meal that day because I didn't want him to say, you know, I will be happy if I get this. You know, as a loving parent, I said, no, you can be happy even if you don't get it. I, I, we need to make really, really clear today, God does the exact same thing. If you say, I will not trust you, God, unless you do this, or I will not be happy, God, unless you do this, God at that moment has to say, let's pause for a little bit. I'm not giving you that until you learn to seek me first and be happy with me only. And when you're happy with me only, then 
I can give you all of these other things as well. There's a priority to this where God has to be number one in our life. If God is not number one in our life, then we will not be happy. I was trying to imagine a way in which, like to make this us understand just how worrying hurts the heart of God. Because when we worry and we say, you know, I don't have this and so um, I am worried, I've lost my peace, I, you know, the, God, you're not enough. This is, what I, this is what I came to. Worrying is like um, if you're married, you're walking down the street and uh, your wife says to you, oh, I wish I was married to him. Or you're walking down the street and um, your husband says to you, boy, I wish I was married to her. I would be happier if I was with them. Wouldn't, wouldn't that be sad? Wouldn't that absolutely break your heart? But that's kind of what worry is. Because when we're worried, when we're anxious, what we're saying to God is, God, you're not enough in my life. I, can't, I need to have this other thing in order to be fully complete. I need to have this other thing in order to be fully happy. Do you understand just how anxiety grieves the heart of God? So how do we get rid of it? Um, remember, the very beginning of the passage began with a therefore. So we're going to move up uh, to verse 19 and get the, get the core of what caused anxiety in the first place. It says, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up treasure for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Our heart follows our treasure. Our anxiety always follows our treasure about things. We're only anxious about things that mean something to us. How an elderly lady came up to me um, after the first service and said, you know what, when I watch Notre Dame play uh, basketball or football, I just get so anxious watching the game, you know, and, you know like uh, I'm watching the game and I see that pass, and I'm thinking, Fuller, catch it, please bring it in, you know, bring that in. And I'm so worried, worried about that. And I said, well, do you get anxious when you watch Ohio State play? No, not at all. I don't care about them. You know what anxiety shows us? Just shows us something that matters to us. That's not necessarily bad unless we're embarrassed about what matters to us. You know, we're embarrassed about the things that produce anxiety. Anxiety just shows us what matters to us. And so he says, don't get suckered in to storing up things on earth. Because that car that you love so much, and that car that you're worried about getting a dent in, just imagine what it's going to look like in about a thousand years. It's going to be a piece of junk, you know? So don't, so don't store up your heart. Don't get anxious about something that's not even going to be here in a thousand years. Don't, you know, moth and rust are going to destroy it, uh, but... Put your heart in things that are going to be around for all of eternity. Um, the only way to illustrate this, I got a game here. I, mean, I don't know how many of you have played this game. Um, seen it before? You like that game? The, the sorry game. Let's, let's, just, let's just imagine that we're playing it right in front here. So here's the board. Okay. We get the board and it's uh, laying out here. Let's imagine that we're yellow. And we start here in the start, and there's like the four, uh, four little start people that are there. You get out, uh, and then you start rolling down here. You get to right here at the green, and you're right on the other person's, um, like, like where they're going to get out. And you're playing the game. What are you feeling at that moment? You're feeling anxious. Why? Because what's going to happen? Yeah. If somebody rolls a one... A, a two also is that okay? I forgot that a one or two. I get it mixed up with aggravation. Same game. Um, <laughs> isn't it the same game? 
Yeah, you get out and you go around the board. And when you're all around the board, at any moment, somebody can land on your little special person here. And what happens if they land on you? You go all the way back to start. Your piece has to start all over again. So you get out and you go around again and somebody lands on you and your piece goes all the way back to the starting point. And do you know what? I see so many people that they are living life and they're heading around the board and their thing gets taken out and their piece, P-E-A, piece, goes all the way back to the starting point. They lose it. They lose their piece. And do you notice on this game, um, where do you get to where you start to not worry again? <laughs> you, stop, you stop your worrying. You know, you call, you're around here. It's called home. And what do they actually write on the board right in here? Because you cannot be taken out right in here. They call it the safety zone. <laughs> because when you're going around here, you can be taken out until you go, oh, I'm in the safety zone right now. And you know, the best is when you're home. That is the Bible right there. That's this passage. It says, if you store up, if you put your kids just here on earth, and, you, and they're in your hands here on earth, you are going to be anxious. But I tell you, you give your kids to God, you put them in the hands of God, and they're in the safe place. You, the God, I, you, I can't do anything with it. You, you take your car, and you put your heart into your car, and I tell you, you're just going to be worrying about it. You're going to wax it and polish it and take it to the dealer all the time. And, and you know, it's just, it's going to steal your peace. And when you give it to God, you say, I just don't have to worry about this any longer. I remember a moment, literally, when I was at the car dealer and I was ticked off at the car dealer. And I was having a battle with God. It's like, God, this bill, bill is so high. And, and I said, God, if you want... It, this is your money anyway. If you want your money going to that dealer, so be it. It's your money. But God, if you don't, deal with it another way. God can, that's, that's releasing things to God. And it's releasing worry. It's releasing that anxiety. And so whenever we see worry, we see that we're seeking something other than God or We've got a treasure that's on earth that we're trying to protect. Do you notice that? Seek first the kingdom of God um, and then uh, don't store up for yourselves treasure. Let's move on in this. He, he, he looks like he changes the whole subject. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? What does that have to do with worry? Um, here, it's a scriptural principle. Worry is affected by our eyes and what we're looking at. What we're focused on, it's even that seeking, that seek first the kingdom of God is focus. It's what our eyes on. If you focus on something long enough, you will begin to worry about that. Um, where your eyes... In fact, uh, what are commercials? A commercial is designed to do one of two things. It's designed to either produce anxiety within you. Oh no, if I don't have their product, people won't love me. <laughs> if I don't have their product, I won't be safe. If I don't have their product, you know, that's... It's designed to produce anxiety within us you look at commercials all day you'll begin to be filled with worry what's another thing a commercial does if I don't have their product I um, you know it's, it's kind of either greed or uh, again people won't love me or I won't be looked at wonderfully and it produces just anxiety within us what are we to do there's a song that I grew up singing. This is where my kids start getting anxious when I start talking about a song in church. <laughs> Believe me, I get more anxious at this point than any. Does anybody know the song, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus? Think about these words. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full 
in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Isn't that powerful? It could be that we're anxious because we're not looking at Jesus. Could be we, we're anxious because he's not the one we're seeking. He's not the one we're looking at. We're looking at the world and we're looking at what others have and we're looking at our stuff and what we could lose. And when we're looking around at all of our stuff and what the, other, the neighbors have, we, it just produces an epidemic of worry. It says, look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. You know what worry is? Worry is the place where something has taken the place of God. I, I've written this down um, because I just want to get it right. When anxiety is felt, it means that something has taken on the attributes of God in our life. That something makes us feel nearer to God. Something is more powerful than God. Something is more loving than God. And we got to get rid of that. When anxiety is felt, something has become more real than God in our life, more practical than God in our life. And we need to get to the place where we say, God, you are enough. If I have you, I have enough. I, I, give, you my, my, I give you my anxiety. Um, I remember a moment, Angie was so gracious to give her testimony up on the, up on the screen there. Uh, Angie might remember this moment in the hospital with Lucas. And uh, I, don't know, I don't know how, how long that was after Lucas was born, but I remember being in the Goshen Hospital, um, sitting across from her, and she's, she's full of anxiety. What parent wouldn't be when your child is back in the hospital after giving birth? And I just remember looking over, we prayed, and I said, you know what, this is a tremendous gift because you have to give him up to God right now. And when you give him up to God when he's two weeks old, it's so much easier than giving them up to God when they're 20 years old. Um, you don't, if, if there's anxiety in our life, it is simply because something has not been given to God. And something has not been offered to him. Say, God, you are enough for me in my life. So, um, Holy Spirit, would you begin to point out anything that we're anxious about? Would you point out anything that um, just re over and over and over again, this is the one thing that we worry and worry and worry about. And as our act of worship today, could you offer that thing to God? It could be your future and if God will provide. It could be something that means a whole lot to you that you're worried about it being taken away. It can be really great things. Um, you're worried about the salvation of your children. And it could be really simple things like, I'm worried about how the laundry is going to get done this afternoon. God, we want to give everything to you and say you're worth it all. And we don't want to succumb to the enemy's attacks. God, we want today to deal with this because we don't want our kids to deal with it. We don't want our grandkids to deal with it. We want one day for our kids, our grandkids, to look Satan in the eye and say, my mom and my dad beat you in this, and I'm going to beat you too. God, would you, would you put that in our hearts? Would you put that desire in our hearts? Would you show us how it grieves you and how it hurts you? And God, would you build tremendous faith within us?